Okay, I'll begin. So the, the audio is bouncing when I talk? Okay, cool. Dear Father, we thank you uh, for this morning. Again, Lord, thank you for these students and for all the hard work they did in the homework. I pray that you'd uh, just reward them uh, with learning and uh, acquiring knowledge and understanding more about your creation. Lord, we thank you again for your many blessings to us this day. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so let me make sure I got all your... That's it, right? String, interesting. Let's see here. Thank you, thank you. Sorry it took us so long to get homework three back to you. I'm not terribly pleased with the return time on that homework. And um, I will do something to get this homework back to you faster. See what happens. All right, so... <coughs> Um, today, I need to talk to you about the things I claimed last time. In particular, I need to prove for you the claim um, that I made. Uh, a couple, I made really three claims, one of which is we've already done. So the claim, um, I, I've divided into two, into three cases, basically. Um, case one, let's say the limit as um, n goes to infinity of 1 over n to the p is equal to 0. And this is for p greater than 0, OK? 2, the limit as n goes to infinity of n to the 0 power is just equal to 1. I won't prove this. This is just stupid. It's the constant sequence 1. It has limit 1. All right. I mean, we already proved that. We prove the general constant sequence limits to the constant. So that's already done. And then the third case, limit as n goes to infinity of n to the p is equal to infinity. All right. This was the, and again, p greater than 0. So I, I stated this a little bit different last time. I just stated it in terms of 1p, and I let p be negative or positive. But I, I think it's probably as useful to write it this way, right? I mean, p is not some reserve notation for us at the moment. It's just a notation I'm using to try to communicate these limits. There will come a time in this course when we talk about the p equals blah, blah, blah series, and that has a reserved meaning. But we're not there yet. Anyway, so how do you prove this? Well, I'll start by talking about how to prove um, number one. So, um, I have erased the scratch work. Let me let me um, talk about <laughs> let me talk about this. So the idea <coughs> is so here's the here's the here's the scratch work that motivates what I have written above here. If we want to show one over n to the p goes to zero, right? What that means is that I need to find a way for each epsilon greater than 0 to um, make 1 over, N, 1 over NP feel small. Um, so and I, I need to make 1 over N to the P less than epsilon. All right? That's my goal. And so of course, that's, I can trade that for 1 over N to the P to be um, less than epsilon, because epsilon is positive, right? And I'm, I'm assuming here, of course, p is greater than 0. All right. Now, so this, I go, oh, well, wait a minute. What I can do is I can take the pth root of both sides. This implies that like 1 over n is less than the pth root of epsilon. Now, why can I do that? You know, if you think about f of x equal to the pth root of x, right? In other words, x to the 1 over p. If you differentiate that, what do you get? Right. My point to you is if x is greater than 0, this is clearly greater than 0, right? 
it's an increasing function. The pth root of 10 is smaller than the pth root of 20. Okay, so the pth root function preserves inequalities. So I can take the pth root of an inequality without losing anything, assuming, of course, that both sides are positive. But we know that here. So I have this, right? And so this tells me what I want, right, is n to be greater than 1 over the pth root of epsilon, right? So do you guys remember the definition of the limit of a sequence? Let me, let me remind you somewhere. I've got some board space. I really don't want to erase certain things here. Um, <coughs> I can erase all this, though. There's, there's nothing terribly profound there. I'd like to leave 4 up, though. So what's the, what's the definition of the limit of a sequence? If we say that, you know, just to remind you, the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is equal to L, what this means, right, is that if we can say for each epsilon greater than 0, there exists, say, n or you could use k, whatever, in the natural numbers such that <laughs> little n greater than or equal to n implies that the epsilon value of a sub n minus l is less than epsilon. OK, so in order to prove a limit exists, I have to furnish this, this, this big n. Or maybe you guys think of it as big k. I mean, it's whatever you want to call it. Anyway, it's this, this, this fixed natural number that if you go beyond that, everything in the sequence is within epsilon units of the limiting value. All right, so man, I'd, I'd like to just use from the scratch work, right? Wouldn't it be nice if I could just say this is equal to, this is equal to n, you know? I, I, would, I would love to say that. Why can't I say that? What's that? Why can I not just say this is equal to n, you know? Yeah, it has to be a natural number. Yeah, a natural number. That's the rub. So that's why I brought into bear it. You see this? See this up here? Let me make it green. And I haven't found it in the book yet. I'm not sure it's in there. But sometimes I think this is called the ceiling function or the next greatest integer function. And so here's a graph of this thing. Like, OK, so from, from 0 to 1, it's, it's it, 0 to 1 not included, it's 1. Um, from 1 to 2, not included, it's 2. From 2 to 3, not included, it's 3. And what we're looking at here is y is equal to the ceiling of x. I just put a roof over it. Some people just use like this for that, I think. I mean, it depends on what you look at. I haven't found it in the book yet, so I'm not sure if the book even has this, but it's something that's useful to know about. So like just to give you a bit of it, you know, OK, so you guys tell me. What would the ceiling of 1.001 be? Two, right. So it's, it's like a really ignorant rounding up thing. I don't know. Or you could think of it like benevolent tipping, or I don't know. Anyway, the point is it's always the next greatest integer. So I could use that, right, to get around this rub, this, this trouble. Because you see, epsilon, the root p root of epsilon, there's absolutely no reason that this is a natural number. So I can't make that a natural number. But what I can do is I can say n is equal to, like, say, the ceiling of the, of the pth root of epsilon, 1 over epsilon, I should say, 1 over the pth root of epsilon. And then I just added 1 just to be, be sure I wasn't missing something. Yep. The 
ceiling function looks like. Yeah, it's just stair steps. What that? Well, we we did that the other day. I mean, it's it's that. And then so n is something like. Maybe this is n. So then, so the this distance here, for example, this right here, this distance would be the absolute value of like a sub n minus l be less than epsilon. That distance. So the point is, for each epsilon, you zoom in closer and closer to the limiting, alleged limiting value. But if the limit exists, you can just keep going out far enough in the sequence so that beyond, like basically, if you could shade this in, the sequence, the range of the sequence past that point all fits within that like infinite ray, thick infinite ray of, of, of height to epsilon. Yep. Yeah, well, 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 I mean, yes. What? What? what do you, I, mean, I don't understand. What I'm saying is, if one over two, I mean, one over um, two root of epsilon is that a natural number? No, not necessarily. I mean, epsilon could be like pi, <coughs> and p could be pi. <laughs> I don't even know what the, the pi root. I mean, it's very yeah. Why did you add the plus one? Just be safe. For kicks. <coughs> Why not? I mean, if you can. Um, the, if, 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 you, if you'd like me to be more honest, it's because there is some chance this actually is a natural number, and you have equality here. But I want strict inequality between n and that, because I need strict inequality for the a sub n minus l limit. So there I need strict inequality, and I need to add one just in that exceptional case that it happens to be the integer that I don't. That, that, I mean, there's, it's very unlikely that I need to add the one, but it's possible, I, th I think. OK, so here's the argument. So this is scratch work, of course. That's not the proof, right? If you don't mind, I'm going to erase the scratch work so we can focus on the proof. <coughs> All right, proof. Let epsilon be greater than 0, all right? Choose n, or you guys might call it k if you follow the book, right? n to be, where's my laser? I thought I had a laser. Oh, man. Where'd my laser go? Well, this is very disappointing. I will find my laser. My favorite part of the day, using the laser. I got no laser. No. Ha ha. Yes. <coughs> there we go. So right here. Boho. Sorry, I left my 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 less ridiculous laser at home. Um, so let epsilon be greater than zero. Choose n to be the greatest integer that's just bigger than the reciprocal of the pth root of epsilon plus 1. Suppose that you have a natural number n greater than or equal to n. Okay. Then consider n is greater than or equal to this because that's 
just what it is, right? Mm -hmm. But if I drop, if I drop the one, right? Then I can I can say this. Of course, this um, this could be just that again. It could be this plus one, right? But um, in any case, this is definitely strictly less than that, right? So I then, um, from here, I get to here by taking the pth power of the inequality, right? So I've got like n to the p is greater than the pth power of this, which gives me n to the p is greater than that 1 over epsilon. But that tells me that 1 over n to the p is less than epsilon. Therefore, 1 over n to the p minus 0 is equal to 1 over n to the p is less than epsilon. Therefore, 1 over n to the p goes to 0 as n goes to infinity by the definition of the limit. We have to study the, the, the difference. I mean, I'm just emphasizing that we're looking at a sub n minus L. OK, so there's that. Now, the next thing I'm about to show you we haven't really done before. And I, I, I'm, and I, I suppose I haven't actually given you a careful definition of this yet, but I should. I've talked about a sequence being unbounded. and I, I forget. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I can't remember. But, but let me give you a careful definition now. Um, here it is. The limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is equal to infinity, all right, if for each big M greater than 0, um, there exists, let's say, capital N in the natural numbers such that if little n is greater than or equal to that capital N, I'll give it feet, um, then what? then a sub n is greater than or equal to n, m, rather. If you don't like my use of n here, tell you what. I, I, there's too many n's here. Let me use k. Wouldn't that be easier? <coughs> Put a k here. Put a k here. You guys probably could see that better, right? So it's kind of the, the opposite of that picture, right? Here the idea is, if I've got this sequence, whatever. Actually, I should probably be doing Then if you pick some m greater than 0, right? then we can choose a k in this case. How about just about here would do? It's this one. And as you can see, a sub n would be like this. So a sub n greater than m for any n that's beyond k. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry, I cut off its feet. Or it grew some feet, depending on how you want to look at things. Here, they all have feet. They all either have feet or don't have feet. It depends on, you know, I don't know. I guess that's a question of style. So you probably shouldn't ask me about it. What's that? Which, would, which uh, I didn't hear what you said, n or m or? M is m referencing like the point after. m, you have to be able to find a k for each m. So m is like arbitrary positive number. If a sequence goes to infinity, that means that no matter how big a value you give me, I can go far enough out in the sequence and get larger than that value. And not just that, everything beyond that point is larger than that value. This is what it means for a sequence to diverge to infinity. 
generically speaking, um, if a sequence doesn't converge, right, it diverges. But that doesn't mean it diverges to infinity. It could, it could go, it could oscillate, right? It could go 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, right? That wouldn't be convergent. But it wouldn't go to infinity either. Of course, you could also define minus infinity, right? You just take the m greater than 0 and replace it with what? If I put a minus here, right? I put a, a less than here, and I put a less than or equal to here. But otherwise, same song and dance. Yep. So for example, sine for sine, is that a reason for not infinity? Yes. Sine and cosine, um, the sequence like sine of n or cosine of n do not converge because they oscillate. Yeah. As did my example of plus or minus 1. OK, so how do we prove this? That um, wh what are we after here? I want to prove for you, try to move it along here. I'll do it over here. So my, my I'm going to erase this because, well, it's done. So the next claim is that the limit as n goes to infinity <coughs> of n to the p is equal to infinity for p greater than 0. All right. <coughs> so let m be greater than 0 and choose k equals to what? Hmm. So he here's some scratch work, all right? So I'm showing you how I thought of it. I need, I, need, I, need, I need to have a sub n, right? I need a sub n is equal to n to the p. I need that to be greater than or equal to um, what um, m, right? <coughs> So of course, the natural thing to do then would be what? This is uh, n is greater than or equal to the pth root of m, right? But then of course we have the problem what? Right, m is not a natural number. Um, so um, we could, we could th say this, though. The pth root of m, right, is less than or equal to the ceiling of the pth root of m. By construction, it's the next greatest integer. It could be equals, but it's usually gr strictly greater than, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I, that, that is an element of the natural numbers. And so basically, I can just, you know, I think I can do that. Yeah. So let's choose k equal to the ceiling of the pth root of m, right? And then consider if n um, is greater than or equal to k, that implies what? That implies that um, n is greater than or equal to the ceiling of the pth root of m, right? Which is, by the way, greater than or equal to the pth root of m. Then what? So you guys understand the rules of this game we're playing? Whatever's in the scratch work part is not, this is like behind the man behind the curtain. This is what drives the argument over here. But this is not part of the argument itself. OK? You must grade me merely on what I write over here. This has to be a complete logical thought for it to be a legitimate proof, right? So that's what I'm aiming for here. m greater than 0, choose k to be like that. If I have n greater than or equal to k, that tells me that n is greater than the ceiling, but the ceiling is greater than or equal to the pth root itself. But then what? I can take the pth power of this inequality, right? Hence, n to the p 
is greater than or equal to m, right? But a sub n is equal to n to the p in this context, right? And that's greater than <coughs> or equal to m, right? For all n which are greater than or equal to k, therefore a sub n goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. Now, to actually prove something's not bounded actually requires some effort, right? You have to show that for an arbitrary positive value, you can find the whole tail of the sequence is above it, right? Some justification is required if you're going to do this carefully. That said, now that we've established this result, we can use it in other examples, which is nice. Yeah. Oh, all the M have feet. I'm sorry. There's only one M here. I'll add feet to them. Feet, 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 feet. It's kind of relaxing. Feet, feet. I think I got them all. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so at this point, I'm going to basically go over to section 11.4 and try to prove a few of those things in there for you. And um, <clears throat> thankfully, we don't have to do everything from the definition. There, we're going to use the theorems we know from section 11.3 and 11.1 and 11.2 and try to build a few results that will be useful to us as the course goes on. All right? So first of all, number one, first claim in section 11.4 is that this is 11.4.1 in terms of the book's numbering. All right. If x is greater than 0, the claim is this. x to the 1 over n goes to 1 as n goes to infinity. <coughs> so for example, 2, right? If I had 2 to the 1 over n, that goes to 1 as n goes to infinity. Whatever you want to put there. If it's a positive number, it goes to 1 as n goes to infinity. OK, let's prove it. So the proof, we can use the composite sequence theorem, basically. What I do is I go, OK, so x to the n, right? We can rewrite that as the exponential of the natural log of x to the 1 over n. Why can I do that? What do, what do I need to know about the thing I'm doing this trick to? Natural log of what? Yeah, but before I can take the natural log of something, what do I need to know about it? Positive, right. If it's not positive, it's not not the good thing, right? Um, so c how do I know that x to the 1 over n is positive? Well, x is positive, right? So the nth root of a positive number is still positive. So I'm certainly entitled to take the exponential of the log of it. Once I have that, that's pretty awesome, because then I have properties of the log to work with. And if I know them, they're useful. So 1 over n, I pull down. And then I'm like, wait a second. This is the composite of the exponential function. Almost, it's almost the exponential. It's not quite the exponential function. You've got to think about natural log of x in the right way here. Natural log of x is a fixed constant. It's a fixed, it doesn't have to be positive, but it's a fixed constant, because x is just some positive real number. It has no dependence on n whatsoever. So if I look at this, I can think about, I've got to introduce a different variable because x is already used up, right? So think about t, a function of t. How about this? Exponential of t times the natural log of x. 
Well, that, that's a continuous function of t, right? If natural log of x is 3, we'd have like e to the 3t. Is that continuous? Everywhere, right? Exponential of an argument multiplied by a constant is a continuous function. But we also have this. We're, what are we putting in here? Well, we're, we're, if you look at what we have, we have this f with what fed into it. Um, Aw, oh man. Ah, oh, I don't need that L and X there. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a doofus. Well, I, you know, again, the earlier section. Come on. There are two ways to fix this, All right? Either I fix the CN or I fix the F. Which do you want me to fix? CN. Un. <laughs> See, because I'm not, I'm not composing with, I, I mean, if, if you plug in, like, check it out, right? F of 1 over n is what? exponential of 1 over n times the natural log of x, right? Yeah. Which is precisely x to the 1 over n. And the way I wrote it for them, I had two natural logs. And they didn't say anything. <sighs> we shouldn't offer calculus 2 at 8.15. It's not. It's not reasonable. It's just not reasonable. Oh well. <clears throat> okay, so look at it then. You have the composite. Yes, sir? Uh, uh, you may be doing this, but can't you just prove that 1 over n goes to 0 as n goes to infinity? And then once you do that, any number to 0 power goes to. But it's not, it's not just any number to the 0 power. It's something that's limiting to the 0 power. It's not an absolute 0. I mean, it, it's not equal to 0. It's something that's tending to 0. Glossing over this distinction will get you into trouble. Let me show you an example where intuition lets you down. Check this out. Length 4. Length three, right? So what happens if I do like this, do like this, do like this, and do like this? So let's call this L2. Still the length of the path L2 is what? Three plus four is seven, right? Yeah? What if I do this? Let's call that one L3. Still 7, right? Because it's still that distance plus that distance plus that distance, that distance plus that distance plus that distance, right? Repeat. Well, you get the idea. I think we can all agree that it's converging to this line, right? So the length of this line must be 7, right? on that. Disturbing, no? Of course, by the Pythagorean theorem, what should it be? Five. five. Is five seven? <laughs> no. No. So, what's the problem? 
I mean, it seems like that stair step should go to that dotted line, right? As the stairs get infinitely small, it gets infinitely close to that dotted line. How can those lengths be different? I'm pretty sure I can prove that that stair step gets infinitely close to the line. Yeah. No, the Pythagorean, I mean, it, the Pythagorean theorem is, is, is not incorrect. It, it, the length of that line is 5. The idea that the, lim that the length of the approximating staircase should be equal to the length of the line is what's wrong. Now, why that's wrong involves limits. And see, that, that leap I made conceptually is analogous to what you wanted me to do in saying that, well, this is really just 2 to the 0. No, it's not. I mean, it's, it's 2 to something that's tending to 0, which is different. That won't get you into trouble many times. But when it does get you into trouble, it can get you into a lot of trouble. <laughs> so this is why we're trying to be careful. But anyway, I am actually going to explain. I mean, what you're saying is the heart of the argument, basically. See, because we have a sequence, 1 over n, which goes to 0, right? You compose that with this continuous function to get this. Then by the, com the comp composite sequence theorem, or the space invader theorem, we didn't decide, I guess. I, I'm going to call it the composite sequence theorem, if you don't mind. If you refer to it as a space invader theorem, I'll know what you're talking about if you, if you really want to. It seems like a lot of writing, though. We have this is the limit of that. But then the composite sequence theorem says I can pass the limit inside the continuous function exponential. Hence, I get exponential of 0, which is 1. I mean, it's the difference between taking a limit and plugging in the limit point. A lot of times, plugging in the limit point's right, right? But there's a subtlety there, which we can't gloss over, because to gloss over that subtlety is to lose calculus. We don't want that. <laughs> OK, I, anyway, so there, there you go. That's proof of that. Let's, let's move on to the next one. Before you know it, my time will be up. And your time will begin. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Your quiz is not that bad. Why are we having quizzes in here, by the way? It's because the tests went badly, is why. All right? And so the only way I know to shake you guys loose is to start giving quizzes. And I'm hopeful that as you take these quizzes, you will learn what it is that you're not understanding more forcefully than the homework is accomplishing at the moment. If homework does its job, You've already figured out it, what it is that you don't know, right? But it's not doing that. Now, I don't know why it's not doing that. Only you know that. I can believe Dr. Dr. Wang's theory of smartphone making us dumber. I don't know. I don't know. But I do want you guys to do better, and that's why we're having quizzes. It is to help you, not to hurt you, believe it or not. The sequences, will be, the, the sequences, listen to me, the quizzes will be worth relatively little points. But I think they will improve your test scores quanti like, like substantially. And then I just have to grade <laughs> quizzes. <laughs> I'll get over it. All right, two. Two is this. If and the absolute value of x is less than 1, then xn goes to 0 um, as n goes to infinity. All right. So 
here's the thing. We're studying the proof, basically, as you consider the sequence a sub n equals to the absolute value of x to the n. If we can show that this goes to 0, it implies that the given thing goes to 0 because we had this, this theorem that if the absolute value of a sequence goes to 0, then the sequence goes to 0 from last time, right? So it suffices to prove that this goes to 0. But check it out. If you have a sub n plus 1 over a sub n, what do you got? Which is what? The absolute value of x, which is, by assumption, less than 1. Therefore, a sub n is decreasing, right? Of course, intuitively, that was obvious, right? If you take a number of absolute value less than 1 and you start powering it up, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. Now, <coughs> let epsilon be greater than 0. Right? What, what am I, what's my goal? My goal is to show that the absolute value of x to the n minus 0 is less than epsilon. Right? Provided that n is beyond some, some integer. So let epsilon be greater than 0. And note that epsilon to the 1 over n goes to 1 as n goes to infinity. Why? <laughs> right, we already proved that. Just take. You just have to think x equals to epsilon, basically. So we just, we just proved that this is true in 1. Very good. So we have epsilon to the 1 over n is a convergent sequence, right? There are two cases. Well, I have them over here, right? Either your epsilon is like larger than 1, OK? So if, if epsilon is larger than 1, it could be like 2. And um, you know, if you take epsilon to the 1 over, um, 1 over n for that, you're going to just kind of go like that to 1. right? You'll just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller until you approach 1 as n goes to infinity. Um, <coughs> on the other hand, if, you're, if your epsilon is between 0 and 1, then you're, you're, you're going this way, right? towards 1. Those are the two cases. <coughs> um, so observe <coughs> that there exists a k in the natural numbers such that what? The absolute value of x is less than epsilon to the 1 over k. In the case that epsilon is greater than 0, I mean greater than 1, it's utterly trivial. You can just use k equal to, like, k equal to 1 will work if epsilon is greater than or equal to 1. If ep again, if epsilon is greater than 1, I can choose k equals to 1, and I'll have that the absolute value of x is less than this. If this thing is larger than 1, it's certainly less than x, the absolute value of x, which is less than 1 here. We're assuming that, right? The more interesting case is if, if, if epsilon is less than 1. If epsilon is less than 1, it could be like a half, right? The absolute value of x is somewhere here. But remember that theorem we had back in the like, first section? If this is the thing it's converging to, which is its least upper bound, you can find something between absolute value of x and, and, and 1, right? Because 0 is over here. So the sequence is, is in here somewhere. And the sequence I'm talking about, of course, is, is epsilon to the 1 over n. There has to be some k so that it's between x and the limit. That's that, least up, that, that theorem we proved right after we introduced the least upper bound axiom. We used, um, it's like 11 point, 
tell you the number in a second here. I'm talking about theorem 11.1.2 on page 529. That one. So that says that I can pick a k that puts this between 1, right? I mean, this is, this is less than or equal to 1, like that. But there's, I, can put, I can find something in the sequence between this and, and where it converges to by that theorem. And then that's pretty much all I need, because then what? <coughs> Excuse me. If n is greater than or equal to k, then the absolute value of x to the n is what? Is less than epsilon to the 1 over k. What's that? Lost my place. Oh, duh. You know what? It would be productive. <laughs> the absolute value of x less than epsilon 1 over k. What's that say about <laughs> the absolute value of x to the, to the k is what? Less than epsilon, right? Well, I, s I think I still have failed to, um, oh, 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 but what's this imply? One more step. Remember, up here, decreasing, right? So if n is beyond k, it's also true what? That x to the n is less than x to the k, right? Therefore, by transitivity of inequality, we get that epsilon of x to n is less than epsilon. And that proves that the limit goes to 0. See, because to be more precise, this is the absolute value of this minus 0, which is equal to, all right, so therefore, the epsilon value of x to the n goes to 0. And that implies that x to the n goes to 0, since x is positive. One more, number 4, I'd like to talk to you about. Number 3, oh, shoot. Well, I don't have time for number 3. Sorry about that. But actually, number 3 we've already done another proof of. Number three is equivalent to, just put p equals to alpha. We already proved number three. It was number one today. Okay, But the argument he gives is a little bit different and useful. Worth reading the book number three, okay? I go through it in the earlier lecture if you want to see me talk about it. Um, so here we go. Four states that x to the n over n factorial goes to zero as n goes to infinity. All right. How to prove this? You fix x in the reals. Choose k in the natural number such that k is larger than the magnitude of x. You can do this, right? Whatever x is, if it's 32, you make k equals to 33. If x is minus 7, you make k equals to 8. Whatever. You can definitely do this, right? So you fix this k. k is fixed. Right? It depends on x, but not n. Then we let n be greater than or equal to this, this k plus 1. And consider the following, k to the n over n factorial. We can rewrite this much like your homework problem, right? Remember the one? Yeah. 2 to the n over n factorial less than 4 over n. Logic here, very similar to how you had to solve that. So what we do is we, we it's all about the k. So we, we split off k factors of k, k to the k, and fix split off a k factorial down here. Then that leaves me with these remaining k's, right? There are n minus k minus 1 of them here because I left another k over there. Does that make sense? 
So I'm just rewriting k to the n as k to the k times a bunch of k's and then times k again. And likewise, n factorial, I'm just splitting off, right? This k factorial has like 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5, da -da 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 -da, all the way up to k. Then what's next? k plus 1, k plus 2, so forth and so on, right until I get <coughs> up to n. But below n, I have what? I've got n minus 1. So that's what happens here, right? Then jump ahead for just a second here. Suppose you can show that that's less than this. There's a question mark why that's true. Okay. If you can show that, though, you're pretty much done, right? Because 0 is less than f sub i of x over n factorial, because this is clearly positive. And this is less than that, because <coughs> we assume that the f sub i of x is greater than k, I mean less than k, right? So if I replace um, x with k to the n, that makes this larger. And then if I have that this is less than that, which is what I'm claiming up here, then I've got this. Well, that's really awesome, because k is just some fixed stupid number. It doesn't have any n dependence. As n goes to infinity, this guy, 0. 0 goes to 0. And so we squeeze x to the n over n factorial to 0 by the squeeze theorem. But obviously, it remains to understand why is this inequality true? Can you guys explain it to me? The one with the question mark right here. So what I'm, what I'm basically saying is the thing in the square brackets right, is smaller than 1. Why is that true? Well, it's not. Yeah, it's because exactly. And you can think about that factor by factor. So like, for example, k over n minus 1. Well, if you look at this, if you solve that, that gives me k over n minus 1 is less than 1. Right? This, if you solve this, is k is less than, I mean, k over n minus 1 is less than 1. How about k over k plus 1? Smaller than 1. k over k plus 2? Smaller than 1. And on down the line, you've got a product of factors smaller than 1, which is collectively smaller than 1. So if I replace that with 1, you got it. Silence. Oh, I guess you've got to take a quiz. So. Anyway, what remains in section 11.4, I will prove with different methods. In fact, I'm going to make use of L'Hopital's rule to prove the remaining results in section 11.4. So we're actually done with it um, at this point. Yeah, you can cut that off. Thank you, sir.